58th year after Aegon's conquest ended, King Jaehaerys celebrated the 10th anniversary of his coronation at the Starry Sept of Old Town. The callow boy the High Sept in the crown that day was long gone. His place had been taken by a man of 24 who was every inch a king. His wispy beard and moustache that had cultivated early in his reign had become a handsome golden beard, shot through with silver. His hair was long and fell almost to his waist. Tall and handsome, Jaehaerys moved with an ease of grace, be it on a dance floor or in the training yard. His smile could warm the heart of any maiden and his frown could make a man's blood run cold. In his sister, he had a queen even more beloved than he was. Good Queen Alassane, the small folk called her. From Old Town to the Wall, the gods had blessed them both with three strong children, two splendid young princes and a princess who was the darling of the realm. In their decade of rule, they had known grief and horror, betrayal and conflict, and the death of loved ones, but they had weathered the storm and survived the tragedies and emerged stronger and better from all they had endured. Their accomplishments were undeniable. The Seven Kingdoms were at peace and more prosperous than they had ever been in living memory. It was the coming together of Aegon the Conqueror's vision. To mark the anniversary, Jaehaerys held a grand tourney in the ever-improving King's Landing. The leaves of the trees had begun to turn a russet and orange gold, and the ladies of the court had worn gowns to match. At the feast that followed the end of the tourney, Lord Rogar Baratheon appeared with his children, Boromund and Jocelyn, to be warmly embraced by the king and queen. This public show of affection showed the rift between them at the death of their mother, Alyssa Valarian, at the birth of their half-sister, Jocelyn, was healed. Lords from all over the realm came to join the celebrations. Lyman Lannister from Castley Rock, Damon Valerian from Driftmark, Prentice Tully from Riverrun, Roderick Arryn from the Vale, even Lords Rowan and Oakheart, whose levies once marched with Septon Moon. Furthermore, Theomor Manderley came down from the north. Lord Alaric Stark, as expected, did not come, but he did send his sons, and with them, his daughter, Alara, to take her place as a waiting lating to the Queen. The High Septon was too old to come, but he sent his newest scepter, Rhaella, who had been a Targaryen, a daughter of Rhaena, twin sister to Arya Targaryen, still shy but smiling. It was said that the Queen wept for joy at the sight of her niece. From her face, she was the very image of her twin sister, who died horrifically, grown older. The winter of 59-60 AC was an exceptionally cruel one. Although who survived its greed, the North was hit first and hardest, as the crops died in the fields, streams froze, and bitter winds came howling over the wall. Though Lord Alaric Stark had commanded that half of every harvest be preserved and put aside against the coming winter, not all his bannermen had obeyed. As their larders and granaries grew emptied, famine spread across the land, and old men bade farewell to their children and went out into the snow to die so their kin might live. Harvests failed in the Riverlands, the Westerlands and the Vale as well, and even down into the Reach. Those who had food began to hoard and all across the Seven Kingdoms, the price of bread began to rise. The price of meat rose even faster, and in towns and cities, fruits and vegetables all but disappeared. And then the shivers came, and the stranger walked the land. The maesters knew the shivers, as they had seen an illness like it a hundred years before. It's believed to have come to Westeros from one of the three cities. Port cities and harbour towns always got the disease first, and hardest. Many of the small folk believed that it was carried by small black rats that could be seen swimming from the holes of ships at dock and scurrying down the ropes that held them. The guilt of the rats was never proved, however. But suddenly, every house in the Seven Kingdoms, from the grandest castle to the humblest of hut, required a cat. Before the shivers were done that winter, the kittens were selling for as much as a horse. The marks of the disease were well known. It began simply enough with a chill. Victims would complain of being cold, throw a fresh log on the fire, huddle under a blanket or a pile of furs. Some would call for hot soup, mulled wine, or against all reason, beer. Neither blankets nor soups could stay the progress of the pestilence. Soon, the shivering would begin. Mild at first, a trembling, a shudder, but it grew worse. By then, the afflicted would begin shivering so violently, their hands and feet would begin to convulse and twitch. When the victim began to cough up blood, the end was near. Once the first chill was felt, death came within a day, and no more than one in five victims recovered. All this the maesters knew. What they did not know is where the shivers came from, how to stop it, or how to cure it. In the winter of 59 AC, the shivers moved across Blackwater Bay. Even before King's Landing, the islands off the coast felt the chill. As well, Kautagar, Maegor's one-time Hand of the King, and the much-despised Master of Coin, was the first lord to die. His son and heir followed him to the grave three days later. On Dragonstone, the Queen's beloved scepter Edith perished. On Driftmark, Daemon Valerian, Lord of the Tides, recovered after being at the point of death. 
but his second son and three of his daughters were killed. The bells tolled for them all, and many lesser men and women besides. The old and young were the most at risk, but men and women in their prime were not spared. Lord Prentice Tully died in River Run. Lyman Lannister, the mighty Lord of Casterly Rock, was taken with, along with many lords in the west. At Highgarden, Lord Tyrrell sickened but survived, only to perish drunk in a fall from his horse four days after his recovery. Rogar Brathian was untouched, and his son and daughter by Queen Elisa Valarian were stricken but recovered, yet his brother, Sir Ronald, died, and the wives of both his brothers. Old Town was especially hit hard, losing a quarter of its population. Lord of the Hightower, Donald the Delayer, could not delay his death. He died shivering. So did the High Septon, two score of the most devout, full third of the Archmaesters, acolytes and novices at the Citadel. In all the realm, no place was sorely as afflicted as King's Landing. Among the dead were two Kingsguard, old Sam Sourhill, and the good-hearted Sir Victor the Valiant, along with three lords of the small council, Albon Massey, Carl Corbray, and Grand Maester Benefer himself. Benefer had served for 15 years through both perilous and prosperous times. Coming to the Red Keep after Maegor the Cruel had decapitated his three immediate predecessors. All the dead would be mourned, but in the immediate aftermath of their passing, the loss of Carl Corbray was found most. With their commander dead and many of the city watch ill, the streets of King's Landing fell prey to lawlessness. Shops were looted, women raped, men robbed and killed for no crime but walking down the wrong street at the wrong time. King Jaehaerys sent his Kingsguard and his household knights to restore order, but they were too few, and he soon had no choice but to call them back. Amidst the chaos, Jaehaerys would lose another of his council, not to illness, but to ignorance. Rigo Drads never lived in the Red Keep. The king made the offer numerous times. The Pentoshi preferred his own house, on the street of silk, the dragon pit looming high above. There, he could entertain his concubines without the disapproval of the court. After ten years in service, Lord Rigo had grown quite fat and could no longer ride a horse. He travelled in an ornate gilded carriage. His route took him through the heart of Flea Bottom, the most lawless district of the city. A dozen of Flea Bottoms, less savoury, came upon Lord Rigo, moving through the streets. Some were drunk, all were hungry, and the sight of the Pantoshi enraged them. They blamed the master of coin for the high cost of bread. One wore a sword, three had knives, the rest snatched up stones and sticks and swarmed the carriage, spilling Rigo to the ground. Onlookers said he screamed for help in words no one could understand. When Rigo raised his hand to ward off the blows raining down on him, golden gemstones glittered on every finger and the attacks grew more frenzied. One of the men pried a stone from the king's newly cobbled streets and brought it down upon Lord Rigo's head again and again. The Lord of Air died, his skull crushed. Even then, his assailants were not done. Before they ran, they ripped off his fine clothes and cut off all his fingers to lay claim to his rings. When word reached the Red Keep, Jaehaerys himself went to claim the body, surrounded by his king's guard. So angry was the king at what he saw that Sir Joffrey Dogger would say afterwards, When I looked upon his face, for a moment it was as if I was looking at his uncle, Magor. The street was full of the curious. Come out to see the king or gaze upon the bloody corpse of the Pentoshi. Jaehaerys wheeled his horse about and shouted at them, I would have the name of the man who did this. Speak now, and you'll be well rewarded. Hold your tongues, and you will lose them. I would have the name of the man who did this. Many of the watchers slunk away, but one barefoot girl came forward, squeaking out a name. The king thanked her, and commanded her to show his knights where the man might be found. She led the king's guard to a wine sink, where the villain was discovered, with a whore in his lap, and three of Lord Rigo Draz's rings upon his fingers. Under torture, he soon gave out the names of the other attackers, and they were also taken. One of their number claimed to have been a poor fellow, and cried out that he wished to take the black, but Jaehaerys said no. He said to the man, The Night's Watch are men of honour, and you are lower than rats. He decided that such men as these were unworthy of a clean death by sword or axe. Instead, they were hung from the walls of the Red Keep disemboweled and left a twist until they died, their entrails swinging loose down to their knees. The girl who had led the king to the killers had a kinder fate. Taken in hand by Queen Alisan, she was plunged into a hot tub of water for scrubbing. Her clothes were burned and her head shaved. She was fed hot bread and bacon. There is a place for you here in the castle if you want it, Alisan told her when her belly was full. In the kitchen or the stable as you wish. Do you have a father? The girl gave a shy nod and admitted that she did. He was one of the ones you hung. Poxy one. Then she told her grace that she wanted to work in the kitchens, as that was where they kept the bread. The old year ended and a new year began, but there were a few celebrations anywhere in Westeros to mark the coming of the 60th year since Aegon's conquest. There were no celebrations. The streets of King's Landing were empty, especially at night. The alleyways were deep in snow, and icicles hung from the rooftops, long as spears. Jaehaerys ordered the gates of the Red Keep closed and doubled the watch on the castle walls. He and his queen and their children attended the sunset service at the castle sept 
Rupert then went to Megal's Holdfast for a modest meal and after retired to bed. It was the early hours of the morning when Queen Alassane was awoken by Princess Daenerys, shaking her gently by the arm. She told her mother that she was very cold. Daenerys Targaryen was the darling of the realm and all that could be done for any man was done for her. There were prayers, medicines, hot soups, scalding baths, blankets, furs and hot stones as well as nettle tea. The princess was six and years passed being waned but the wet nurse was summoned for some believed that mother's milk could cure the shivers. Many maesters came and went. Septons and septers prayed. The king commanded that a hundred new rat catchers be hired at once and offered a silver stag for every dead rat. Daenerys wanted her kitten and so her kitten was brought to her but as the shivering grew more violent it scrummed from her grasp and scratched her hand. Near dawn Jaehaerys bolted to his feet, shouting that a dragon was needed, that his daughter must have a dragon, and ravens took wing for Dragonstone, instructing the dragon keepers to bring a hatchling to the Red Keep at once. But none of it mattered. A day and a half after she'd woken her mother from sleep, complaining of feeling cold, the little princess was dead. The queen collapsed in the king's arms, shaking so violently, and some feared that she too had the shivers. Jaehaerys had to take her back to her own chamber and give her milk of the poppy to sleep. Though near exhaustion, he went next to the yard and loosed Vermithor, flying to Dragonstone to tell them there was no need for the hatchling after all. On his return to King's Landing, Jaehaerys drank a cup of dream wine and sent for Septon Bath. How could this happen? He demanded. What sin did she commit? Why would the gods take her? How could this happen? But even Bath, the wise man had no answers for the king. The king and queen were not the only parents to lose a child to the shivers. Thousands of others, highborn and low, knew the same pain that winter. For Jaehaerys and Alassane, however, the death of their beloved daughter must have seemed especially cruel, for it stuck at the very heart of Jaehaerys' doctrine of exemptionism. Princess Daenerys had been a Targaryen on both sides, with the blood of old Valyria, pure, running through her veins. Then those of Valerian descent were not like other men. Targaryens had purple eyes and their hair gold and silver. They ruled the skies on dragons. The doctrines of the faith and the prohibitions against incest did not apply to them and they did not get sick. They should not get sick. Since Aenar the Exile first staked his claim to Dragonstone, Targaryens did not die of the pox or the bloody flux. They were not afflicted with any sickness. They would not succumb to worm bone or a clotted lung or any of the myriad of pestilences and contagions that the gods, for reasons of their own, see fit to loose on mortal men and women. They were fire and blood, blood of the dragon, a purifying fire that burned out all such plagues. It was unthinkable a pure-born princess should die shivering as she was some common child, yet Princess Daenerys did, even as they mourned for her, the sweet soul she had been. Jaehaerys and Alassane must also have been confronted with the awful realisation. Maybe the Targaryen were not so close to gods as they had believed. Maybe, in the end, they were only men. <laughs> <laughs>